Okay. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Okay, welcome to everyone here. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you here once again in this series, Chris uh, Freeman Honor Series. Uh, this is the 102 series of lectures. Uh, here uh, we are uh, sharing the, the, five, uh, the fifth um, event of this series and uh, 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 today we will have two papers, young scholars papers that are going to present to explore the application of uh, national innovation systems to the, the, the framework, the theoretical framework of national innovation system to specific problems. And also we will have uh, several discussion to, to, to comment the presentation of young scholars. We will have uh, young scholars also that are going to comment those papers and senior scholars, which uh, we think is a very nice way to integrate a different generation of scholars in these activities. So um, I, I am just going to give the floor to the first presentation. The first presentation would be in charge of Muyang Liu, and then uh, you, you will have 20 minutes to, to present your your paper and then Hannah, Ned and Yang will comment in seven minutes each the, the presentation of, of Mu Yang. So I'm sorry if I am spelling uh, badly your names. Uh, uh, and uh, okay, let's go Mu Yang, uh, the floor is yours now. Oh, hello everyone. Uh, good morning. <laughs> hello everyone. Uh, hello, dear professors and students. Uh, it is my honor to be here to share my research with you. Uh, thank you. Uh, give me this chance. And um, today, my topic is about the how disruptive innovation of travel digital platform gains digital mercy based on the DD platform. And uh, uh, I will have the five parts to um, to give my presentation. And the first is the research background. Like uh, we live in the digital platform, it is a new business model based on the digital technology. And it has many advantages that um, make our life uh, better and convenient and easier, like the car online car platform and online shopping uh, platform. Um, yes, they will uh, give us uh, more convenience. However, as a new entrant of the market, this kind of disruptive innovation also faces many challenges, maybe because of its novelty and maybe out of our understanding that we cannot understand it. So it is difficult for us to use, use it. For example, like Didi, at the first time, it facing the strength of the traditional taxi drivers or questioned by relevant government. So there are many conflicts um, happening during the development of digital, uh, of disruptive innovation. And what's the reason of so many conflicts happening during this time? And maybe because of the conceptuality from different stakeholders, namely the innovation literacy issue. And because of the disruptive innovation of digital platforms value proposition is really different from the existing technology paradigm that like the digital technology and our conception habits um, and the institutional logic. So, um, so there have some the legitimacy thresholds uh, make the disruptive innovation have a high failure rate. So it is really necessary to further research the question about how the disruptive innovation to gain legitimacy. 
and the threat or radical uh, background is about the legitimacy. And what is the innovation legitimacy? It, it is a conception, a perception. If you feel that the innovation actions is desirable, proper, or appropriate, you will think it is it will have the legitimacy um, uh, within our society, uh, the system of norms, values, beliefs, and definitions. And because the disruptive innovation faces more uncertain stakeholders, behaviors, and complex dynamic relationship between them, and in the complex institutional environments, uh, stakeholders they will use different cognitions, norms, and regulations to guide their legitimacy judgments. They will have different, uh, even the conflicting perception and judgments of the innovation. Therefore, our research question is how disruptive innovation of digital platform gains legitimacy under the diverse judgments of stakeholder. And the uh, theoretical background is the existing studies have limited about the understanding of the legitimacy judgments. On the one hand, uh, there is no um, di distinguished different types of uh, one, uh, uh, audience. Um, they make the audiences uh, all in the overall concept of the organizational event Environments. And on the other hand, they focus on the certain types of audience, for example, the investors, and want to promote their fundings to other types of audience. And based on the above uh, backgrounds, uh, we will research uh, the three questions to fill the research gap. First is to what are the stakeholders of behaviors and value conflicts during the development of of disruptive innovation of digital platform. And second is to how disruptive innovation entrepreneurs attempt to gain legitimacy during, during so many different stakeholder judgments. And the third is what's the rule of the dynamic evolution of disruptive innovation, legitimacy like this picture, and how disruptive innovation to gain legitimacy from so many different stakeholders. And after the second part is the literature review that we focus on the first part is so what is the disruptive innovation and literacy. Uh, uh, we will uh, similar with this different products like the digital uh, digital camera and iPhone and uh, not Abby and online Didi. They will challenge the old one. This is the disruptive innovation. Yes, and disruptive innovation, it is a um, classical concept from the uh, Christian 1997. Uh, it is a process of the uh, beginning uh, at the new markets or marginal markets at the beginning and with the development of the performance of your products and eventually attract the mainstream consumers and uh, change the original technolog technological paradigm and market competition pattern. And this is kind of uh, innovation gain more and more attention from the industry and practice and theoretical scholars. scholars. Um, and the, a series of theoretical explorations focus on core issues like the marketing positioning, uh, behavior characteristics, and the and because and the legitimacy questions because the disruptive innovation uh, difference and conflicting with the ex existing technology paradigm and it often faces the restriction of legitimacy threshold. Be, uh, so we need, need so disruptive innovation need more uh, resources from different stakeholders and to uh, and to to live and to grow grow. So. And the uh, legitimacy, innovation legitimacy is also the uh, perception that if the innovation is desirable, proper, or appropriate. And so far, uh, there are three uh, perspectives of uh, scholars to analyze how to analyze the legitimacy. There are the strategic, institutional, and evaluator perspective. And we focus on the third one, the evaluator. Um, the evaluator perspective studies uh, legitimacy in the eyes of audience and different audience they have their own subjective evaluations on different uh, on in, in innovations and institutional and strategic um, perspectives they um, emphasize on the organization itself 
and in the context of digital economic and evaluatory perspective is benefit and suitable for our research. So we focus on the third perspective. And the, uh, and the second part of the literature review is uh, focused on the um, um, stakeholders' legitimacy judge, uh, judgments. And the uh, scholars from uh, the social uh, psychology, um, they will focus on three dimensions about the instrumental, relational, and moral um, different uh, dim dimensions to make uh, how the stakeholders to do the legitimacy judgments. The instrumental um, is the one to facilitate the individual's goals like the if it's, uh, efficiency or utility. And relational is focused on the self-worth, like the fairness and benevolence. And moral one uh, focuses on the ethical values. And this is the, from the social philosophy of how to the di different stakeholders to make their legitimacy judgments. And also some scholars, uh, researchers focus on two key types of legitimacy judgments. The first is the um, pragmatic and uh, normative. A uh, pragmatic similar with the instrumental one and normative similar with the moral one. And third is the institutional logics perspective to distinguish different audience. There are th uh, seven different institutional logics like the family one, uh, community, religion, state, market, profession, and corporation. The seven institutional logics, for example, the government, agencies, they will use the state logic to uh, make the legitimacy judgment to pursue the higher uh, technology and uh, serve the public good. And there are also some scholars based on the value basis uh, for this, uh, the three one, the material value and spiritual value and the ethical value, the material value similar with the instrumental one and the spiritual value similar with the uh, relational one and the ethical value similar with the moral one. And all these um, perspectives emphasize the different uh, dynamics and even conflicts of stakeholders' uh, legitimacy judgments. And the uh, third part of our literature review uh, we, uh, focus on the behaviors to gain legitimacy. Uh, some scholars, they focus on the same audience. The, they look at the audiences of uh, one concept and the men uh, 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 focus on the three strat four strategies like the obedience, choice, and manipulation and create and these four strategies to gain legitimacy. And recently some scholars, they will uh, put up with the, um, uh, the framing uh, strategy to manage to manage legitimacy to cross various audience that like the Fisher 1917. And uh, the framing is a way that um, uh, the innovators to quickly and to adjust the content of their um, presentations and videos and documents to focus on uh, what the focus on points, points to let their uh, stakeholders to know what, what is it and how to use it. And Thompson will put up the three strategies to um, to from different stakeholders group. And also uh, scholars they will say that the uh, digital mercy is a process. Uh, it will establish over, over time and there are many digital mercy thresholds and it is a dynamic uh, process. And um, based on our literature review and we use the case study as our research method and, and we will use three principles to pick up our uh, case study, the typical cases, the a targeted sampling strategy and the availability of the data. So we choose the DD as the case study. And this is the DD's innovation ecosystem. And our, we, uh, based on the key events of DD and the previous uh, literature, we depart the DD's development into three parts. The first is the market entry and market disruption and market expansion. And we use the data resource from first hand and second hand. And we use the export exploration research method from the opening coding and to the second constructs and main constructs to uh, to analyze our data and the four is the case analysis and this is our the uh, data uh, based on the table two that we figure out what the different stakeholders behavior and the figures of what what they what they say and what they 
think. And um, this is the table two. And we draw the picture, the figure three, to clear what the customer, uh, the different stakeholders' behaviors. Like this, um, the customer's behavior, they uh, at the beginning, they resist the innovation and delay to use it. And the um, traditional drivers and also refuse to use it and resist to use it because they feel uh, uh, cognitive conflicts and emotional conflicts about what is DD and how to use it. And they are afraid of use it. So this, uh, so they have the resistant um, behaviors, and the innovator used uh, subsidies and users education and even the built relationship between them and let you know what is it and they surprised to find it and interesting to try to do use it and know the pragmatic uh, about dd so they choose their behavior about try to use it imitate to use and share to use and accept it and continue to use it and this is the uh, the two sizes users the evolution their behavior evolution. And we also draw the figure four to, to make clear the key uh, resource providers, providers like the government and investor. They first also refuse, refuse it and refuse to invest because of the cognitive resistance and cognitive conflict. And in innovator use the lobby uh, strategy to lobby the governments and also the user feedback to also uh, uh, impress the um, uh, the power to let this uh, key resource uh, providers to open the policy window and investment window and uh, conclude the two, um, uh, the two pictures and we uh, find the process of the obtaining innovation is to mercy about uh, of DD like the core stakeholders that they at the beginning they will have the cognitive conflict and uh the emotional conflict and they will use the resistant behavior and the innovator used the seeding strategy to to uh, to make the cognitive convergence and to to make them to change their behavior to tools and open the policy window and in Western window. Uh, the seeding strategy uh, like the, to, to, to let you know what is it and how to use it and share the knowledge of the disruptive innovation of DD. And this is the first part. And the second part is the market disruption. We use the similar ways to analyze the data and the the figure six is the behavior of the um, uh, uh, different of the core and pre um, pre for here in stakeholders in this stage um, that the, the inco incumbent incumbent uh, agents and government and customer and innovation value chain firm behavior they used the alliance or cooperation and we draw this. Uh, this uh, picture, uh, figure seven, to the process of obtaining uh, innovation in legitimacy of DB that Carl and Perry three uh, stakeholders that they at the beginning used the recent behavior because of the incumbent interest and in conflicts about uh, maybe because the market share uh, competent with the traditional one and the innovator used the accumulation and recon uh, reconciliation strategy and creation strategy to light to synergy development and policy response and continue to use um, to change their um, behavior. So this time the society uh, development, the new logic, the new institution about how to use the online um, the travel uh, of DD. And the three parts of the market expansion is the, the table four. Mm -hmm. And we also, uh, the DD uh, uh, feel feelings, uh, the social responses of, uh, of the, uh, because of some accidents happens. And so the DD uh, will feel, feel some uh, social responsibilities. And also um, they, uh, they say that their vision is benefit broader communities and create a higher value for society. And we used uh, the broader uh, behaviors uh, from the reselection and strong normative expectation and strong normative co uh, constraint, and the, also the co creation ecosystem. And innovator used uh, through actu actual activity fulfilling responsibilities and standardizing govern uh, governance, and also uh, to develop the co governance of the ecosystem. And with the process of obtaining uh, legitimacy, is about the 
broader stakeholder behavior and uh, uh, maybe because of the safety, the values conflict about the national safety, national values, national safety and the personal safety, the um, and the innovative use to repair strategy and core creation strategy to to develop the core governance by broad broad uh, stakeholder. And from the whole process that the dynamic evolutions of DD like for, at the beginning from the cognitive uh, complex to the cognitive converg uh, convergence uh, and in which we use the seeding strategy to face the uh, core stakeholders behavior, resist and maintaining uh, tradition. And the second part is the base basically on the uh, incumbent interest complex and uh, the innovator used the uh, community uh, accumulation and reconciliation strategy and creation strategy to face the core and periphery stakeholders behavior and to develop the institutional logic convergence. And the third is the market expansion uh, pride uh, for the innovator used to re re repair and co-creation strategy to uh, call concentration uh, ecosystem and to face the uh, normality convergence requirements. So this is the process of the development of DD's legitimacy. And our uh, conclusion, first of all, is the, uh, uh, the the process of the legitimacy of DD is from the complex and to the synergy in the, during these different stakeholders. And the, uh, the, the complex is the crisis stage of the, of the disruptive legitimacy, and the synergy is the improvement of the stage of the uh, legitimacy. And the second conclusion is the different stage will the urgency and the importance of stakeholders different for the exam uh, at the beginning and uh, the two sides of users uh, this cognitive feedback is the key to market entry. And second is the com combinant and the government uh, and their reconstruction behavior is the key to realize the market disruption. And the third is the broad stakeholder and, and their reselection behavior is the key to realize the market expansion. And the third uh, conclusion is the, uh, the innovators use different strategies to gain uh, legitimacy. And further, uh, the family is the conflict and synergy is the driving factor of the uh, disruptive innovation leads to mercy. And our contribution is from the evaluation perspective and also from the view of uh, conflict and synergy to analyze the uh, disruptive innovation leads to mercy. And our uh, uh, family, we put up with the uh, uh, conceptual framework and also uh, the practical implications for the enterprise to face different conflicts and the uh, policy for government. And the last is the lim limitation of our research is we'll focused on single case study and travel industrial. So further, we will uh, use more cases and to uh, further our study. And so this is uh, my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Muyan, for stick uh, very strictly to the time. So we will have full time for for comments now. Thank you for sharing this very interesting presentation on disruptive innovation. So I, I would like to, to ask to discuss and to, to try to, to, to shed some light about how innovation systems is related with uh, this uh, presentation and, and how we could uh, use more. Uh, I, I, I see a lot of uh, uh, point of connections with innovation system literature and, his case, and her case but uh, uh, it should be highlighted, I think. So Hannah uh, Schmutzler uh, is going to make her comments now. So please, Hannah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Veronica. Uh, before I relate to what you were just asking me, um, I wanted to uh, make uh, some general comments on the presentation of Muyang. Uh, Muyang, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I think it's a hugely interesting um, research uh, with a very rich case that you have. And um, 
trying to uh, address some of the elements that I'm going to mention right now, I think um, you can um, very much improve your research paper specifically, um, such that it really can turn into a fantastic, um, a fantastic research. So uh, what you did is uh, you first started out with a nice literature review. You mentioned uh, several elements uh, such as the three types of legitimacy, uh, then the institutional logics, uh, value spaces, um, then strategies in order to gain legitimacy. And you also talked about the threshold of legitimacy. All of that is uh, really important. And um, I think that uh, the main issue that I would like you to work on is to connect your analysis that you did to these theoretical constructs. So what I was trying to uh, read in your paper, and I did the same thing now with your presentation, which was very much um, uh, guided by your research paper is try to find a reflection of these theoretical elements that you mentioned in the literature review in your analysis. And they were not clearly there. Uh, so um, in order for you to help you understand a bit how you can connect these things, um, I have um, four questions that I think can help you guide in this uh, aspect. So the first one is, um, you talked about institutional logics and you talked about stakeholders, uh, but what I didn't find is uh, whether the different stakeholders have a different kind of institutional logic and because of that, they generate conflicts of values. So this is something uh, I think that your analysis needs to start out with because your research question also starts out with what are value conflicts that we can uh, see uh, among the stakeholders? And the second question uh, that you have connects to that is what does the um, disruptive innovator uh, or the disruptive entrepreneur do in order to uh, resolve those conflicts and gain legitimacy? So the second question uh, that you should ask yourself and try to see in your again, really rich case is which are the strategies that led to which kind of legitimacy? So you mentioned in your literature review that there are different kinds of legitimacy. And you also mentioned that there are different kinds of strategies uh, that stakeholders, um, uh, that the innovator can uh, employ in order to gain legitimacy among the stakeholders. Uh, what I was trying to figure out uh, is, in your case, how the strategies that the innovator employed towards each one of the different stakeholders that most likely have a different institutional logic uh, led to certain kinds of legitimacy. Okay. Then the third question uh, that I think will help you guide in, in trying to connect uh, the theory with your analysis is what was fundamental in order to obtain the legitimacy threshold? Because in the end, uh, if you're talking about a disruptive innovation, what uh, you need to see is at what point did it surpass the threshold that it was uh, then having the legitimacy it needed in order to succeed in the market. But what we can't see in your analysis, clearly it is there, but uh, you need to bring it out much more clearly, is what was fundamental in obtaining that threshold of legitimacy. And the fourth element, and that is something that you did not take into consideration in your entire analysis, is you're talking about a digital platform. Digital platform, and as an economist, um, you uh, very clearly connected to something that's called uh, network externalities. And digital platforms do have network externalities. And you did not take into consideration, uh, and I think it's very much connected to what I just said about the legitimacy threshold, 
is what kind of role did these network externalities play in gaining that legitimacy uh, threshold? So these are four questions that I think will help you bring out much clearer the connection that is there, but doesn't come out clearly between the literature review that you did and your analysis of the really rich, rich case study that you have. You need to exploit it in a much better way. And I think you can do that. Um, and there are two other elements that I would like to mention is um, in your analysis, uh, in a qualitative case study, and that's what you're doing, what you need to do in your analysis is tell a story. Uh, you have some really nice tables that summarize uh, some of your elements, but these tables are not reflected in what you're writing in the text. Uh, so you need to, to really tell a story so that the reader understands what you're trying to say and not refer to the tables where it's summarized. And then the third issue in your data description, you need to be a bit more detailed, meaning that you need to indicate uh, when did you uh, conduct the interviews? Who were the stakeholders? Usually what you have in qualitative case studies is that you have a table that uh, provides some characteristics of the uh, interviewees uh, that you interviewed. You, uh, you need to state whether it was face-to-face uh, -face interviews, uh, how long that lasted, these kind of elements. That's, that's a minor issue, uh, but it needs to be there in order for your research to be evaluated as a valid, reliable, and viable research. So these were my initial, um, initial uh, comments. And now trying to come back uh, a bit to uh, Veronica's question of how to connect it to the innovation uh, systems literature. I think that, um, and without trying to make too much promotion about my own work, uh, <laughs> I wanted to mention it here that I have written uh, quite a few pieces um, on the connection between entrepreneurial ecosystems and innovation systems. And I think uh, if you look into uh, the connection that exists between the innovation system and the entrepreneurial ecosystem that actually uh, were, have the same kind of root, even though nowadays they're very much uh, developing alongside parallel lines of uh, research, then you have a good answer to the question of how can you bring in ideas from the innovation system literature that is uh, more developed uh, than the ecosystem, entrepreneurial ecosystem literature currently. Thank you, Hannah, very much. Muyang, uh, let's uh, go into the next uh, discussion and then you, you will have some time to, to answer all of them. So we are going to Jun Jin uh, comments and discussion. So, June, if you're here, okay. yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, at first, as I must say, it's a very interesting topic about the digital platform and the le legitimacy of the digital platform. And uh, you give uh, uh, a historic story of the case and uh, some of the interesting findings of the um, findings of the paper, some of the uh, the figures. Um, I have some the uh, at first I uh, must say I have the some the comments is the same as the uh, Hana. It's for uh, for example the research methodology. It's the case study and uh, as well as like uh, uh, the stakeholders and the legitimacy of the stakeholders at the different stage. So that is you must make it very clearly. That is the first one. The second, um, you mentioned the innovation le legitimacy and as well as the disruptive innovation legitimacy. Um, so what is, the, what is the definition of your, uh, in your research? Um, from, 
from your literature review, when you talk about the innovation legit legitimacy, that is more about the innovation activities. Uh, for example, like you mentioned about the norm value beliefs of the like the innovation activity uh, actions. But when we talk about the DD platform, this is the product. The platform is an innovative product of the DD company. It's not an innovative action. So that is for my understanding, that is the difference. So you're talking about the innovation, the legitimacy of the innovation action or the legitimacy of the innovative product, the digital platform. And on the other way is like uh, you use the disruptive innovation legitimacy or you talk about the disruptive innovation. Uh, from my opinion, the disruptive innovation, that is means it's like uh, it's happened one point. So when it's, for example, for the DD, DD platform, when it's launched in the Chinese market, we think this is a disruptive innovation. But after it, then it's a sustainable innovation. It's not a disruptive. So is this okay for you or is this should you use the disruptive innovation legitimacy in your research or you should find another term and for your research. So based on this, that is the other thing is like uh, for the, um, you use the three stage, the period of the DD and uh, when you, when you uh, talk about the three stage, um, three stages, three period of the DD, and you, you, you say you, uh, there is a research about the Xiaomi case, and uh, they mention about the three stage of the Xiaomi case. So that is why you adopt, or that is why you define the DD platform to three stage. But in fact, for the Xiaomi case, it's a complete different in the each stage of the Xiaomi, they have the different the model, a different, not model, sorry. Uh, in the different stage, Xiaomi has a different disruptive innovation. So, so they have changed their the business model. So that is a different, that is a little bit different. There is a difference between the DD and the Xiaomi. So that is why, uh, that is a reason for me, I will think you, you should explain it more clearly why you use the three period of the DD, like the fig two, how you define it. And this is one. And the other is like, uh, um, there is a, uh, in this case, the legitimacy is changed in different stage. Um, and there are many stakeholders in each stage, but uh, for a company, when they make the, uh, when they make their the strategy, they have to think who are their critical stakeholders. So that is like, a, uh, uh, you have the different stage and each stage you have the different the, um, stakeholders and there have the different the legitimacy actions or the issues, but the, which one are important? Are they the same? They, are per, uh, they have to play the same, the roles or the actions to the DD or they are different. And the, the other is like, uh, um, when you talk about the, wait a minute. 
when you talk about the um the case uh, the first period uh, the first state the first period and the, you you talk about the taxi driver behavior in the fig three but as i know that's when the dd started in china and they that is the platform not for taxi driver that is a platform for the rider hailing drivers that is why there is a problem or there is a questions and from the second stage second period of your paper like the the in the questions from the government agency in table three so you have to revise your case there's a, some the mistakes that if in the case and this is uh one and for the case uh, for the research methodologies um i have one comment and for it and you um, please give more the information about the data collection um, for example uh, which the questions you ask and uh, the length of each interview and uh, when you did the interview actors and uh, the other is also is did all interviews interview interview uh, gave answers to all the three all the three periods and i have the other the two comments and for the for the development of the paper the first one um for the dd platform perhaps we we have to think about the influence of the monopoly um dd platform is num number one is the largest the travel platform in china so that is like uh, um is there any inference of this there is uh, the market power uh, to the act uh, to the drivers as well as to the passengers uh, if if it is true if it's true and your research if it's true, there is an inference from the monopoly of the DD platform, then how to improve the generalization of the findings? Because your case is for uh, the uh, for the not for the normal, the small platform. So what is you have to think about generalization of your findings. This is one. And the last, the comments and the, for the paper is like, uh, uh, which problem or is there any the legitimacies now and for the DD uh, uh, to the DD because uh, in China, oh. we have the private information protection law of China, which is enforced in november so perhaps they have the other the legitimacy issues and for the dd because now it's you still writing your paper then you have to think about the current issues so this uh, is I'm, all my okay. comments to the paper uh, i shall say I, i'm going to say that uh, the time is out soon so if you have finished uh, already yes, I have finished perfect. the okay. comments and to the paper. Should I just say one sentence and for the innovation system? Just one, just one, sen one sentence, two uh, or three uh, seconds. <laughs> okay. Because we, we I, have another comment after you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just said uh, that because it's uh, like a very, uh, uh, so there is a comment, uh, uh, there is a question and from the chair is about the innovation system. So for from this one, I was just to think what is the innovation system in for the digital uh, economy and for the digital issues and as well as we have to think about the co-evolution of actors, actions, strategies, as well as um, the um, values 
and even the institutional change in this kind of the innovation system. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, Shun, very much. Uh, we are going to uh, straight forward to Ned, Ned's comments, so we have uh, time enough to answer them. So, Ned, go ahead, please. Hi, very nice to uh, see you all today and um, have a chance to participate again in one of these great events. Um, I um, Well, some of the things I wanted to say have already been said, so I'll, I'll be uh, relatively brief. And um, also when I first read the abstract, I hadn't seen the full paper. I must say that the paper responded to a lot of my initial um, queries. And um, I think it's a, it's a good paper. I think it's, um, I find it quite original, quite, um, and I wasn't terribly familiar with the legitimacy uh, li literature. And I think this is a, an, an interesting way to begin to think about what I would say is actually a learning process in part. <clears throat> and you might want to tie in the um, innovation systems literature by seeing that there was this process of educating the public or the, the, the um, passengers and other stakeholders um, over time. And that could be, I think, tied into um, um, the national innovation systems approach with um, interactive learning between different stakeholders and so on. Um, let me just say, I think the, the literature review seems quite comprehensive now and, and discusses this concept of legitimacy from different points of view. One thing is I looked at a few as I, I looked at a few of the specific references. It seems to me that most of the literature that's on um, that's most that's not in say cognitive psychology, social psychology is actually talking about organizational legitimacy in general, or possibly new ventures. But so if this is indeed um, one of the few studies that's focusing on um, what might be called um, disruptive innovation, and I think you, you should bring that out, that there is um, an attempt to treat a new phenomena and um, that that's one of the um, um, value added of the paper, that it's, um, it's taking these background concepts, but um, looking at how it applies to a specific kind of a, uh, case of digital transformation. Uh, the other be maybe, well, I think for a European um, readership, we always think about Uber. And as you begin to read the details, you see that it's quite different. Um, and uh, that raised some questions for me. For example, um, to my knowledge, um, Uber never tried to actually work with taxi cab drivers. It was a private car. It um, provided an alternative service. And I know of no cases where Uber, you know, was providing an app that would be used by taxis who would have um, uh, their own um, employment contracts. So this seems to be quite, quite different, actually, from Uber. And then when you, when you just present this, in a, if you're going to publish something in the, um, in the, for a, uh, a wide uh, Western audience as well as Chinese audience, I think you might want to bring out a few of these distinctions because people automatically are going to be thinking of Uber and making comparisons. The other thing, um, which is just a really a detail, but do we need to revise our thinking about what a disruptive innovation is? If you think about Christensen's concept, take it strictly, it starts in the bottom, right? We look for um, underserved or ignored segments of the population. You have often a discussion about offering cheaper and um, more accessible services. And then you, um, it kind of is almost invisible to the incumbents and then it moves up. But I, I don't, Uber didn't work that way. Actually, I don't know if you know, Uber started with uh, black lim 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 limousines at the top of the market and then moved down. So in that sense, it didn't follow this upward um, trajectory that uh, is often associated with um, the idea of disruptive. And so my, even though it's just, um, it isn't fundamental, would you really say that Didi was catering to an underserved, ignored segment of the population when it first came in? Or was it just simply providing services that for people who already use taxis? And it, it doesn't make it any less disruptive, but I think it is something, um, since you refer to Christensen's concept as being this sort of coming up from the bottom, maybe that, that should be um, clarified. Um, I like the way you 
develop it around stages. Um, I think that's um, a very useful way of um, presenting the, the case material and the idea that the legitimacy issues are different at different phases. Um, and that would be then coming to your conclusions. Still, I wonder, can we um, talk about disruptive innovations in general? Or is this also the conclusion sort of, um, you stress a lot bilateral users. And I think also in digital platforms, there's a question of trust posed in different ways. Um, commercial platforms, it's a question, can you trust that the, the goods are gonna be delivered? Uh, here, there may be a question of trust about, can I um, use my bank, my, I don't know, whatever sort of mobile money or whatever money is used to pay for the taxi cab drivers, or can I just pay in cash? Uh, some people may prefer to pay in cash, precisely because there is a problem of trust in the digital platform uh, that, that can be more or less present in different um, societies. But I'm just wondering if, um, if the conclusions might be um, partly conclusions that are pertinent to digital platforms more than, say, any kind of uh, disruptive innovation. That would be one question. Um, Yeah, for the I agree that, that to have a bit more on the um, even though you have now a table to have a much more elaborate table on the sources of information, as if any case study you know list giving um, some specifics about the type of um, in how many interviews when they were conducted, what what people and uh, bring out um, you know more fully, and also if the interviews are pertinent for looking at only certain types of stakeholders and what sort of data sources would you, um, would you have used mainly for say investors or administrative government officials? What, because it's part of the, the exercise here, what, what, what kind of challenges did you face in getting, um, getting information from some of the stakeholders and what, would, what uh, lessons could you offer to aspiring young researchers that are trying to get um, you know, think about how to, how to go about this and, or did you face some major challenges that were um, particularly important for certain statements? That would be one. Um, yes, I agree with what you have to say. Um, and maybe it's also part of um, implicit in some of the things that um, Zhang Jin was saying. I think the, um, the tables contain a lot of information, but I don't think most readers, unfortunately, are not gonna read the fine print. And so I think you need to um, elaborate, summarize what's in those tables. And one way to do it might be actually for each phase to have a subsection for each kind of stakeholder. That sounds a bit perhaps structured, but I think since the issues change over time for the different stakeholders, that could be a useful way of actually uh, presenting what's in the tables if you wanted to then put them in the in an annex, you could along with some commentary about the coding process, because I see there was a three stage coding, but it's not explained, but that could be part of an annex and I don't think it would be want to be in the main text. So I would agree with that. I think it would be good to have a story. And I, in that story, I would have some very nice quotes with certain points you want to make. This often is, um, it brings things out in a way that just describing it can't. So, um, for example, now one thing I, um, I, I noticed, and this maybe relates to some of the things that Chen Jin was saying, in the, um, I think it's the disruptive stage, you read the, uh, what's in the table, and it looks like Didi made a lot of overtures to taxis, drivers, and even had a partnership with a taxi company. That doesn't sound like disruption, that sounds like accommodation and seeking to um, negotiate a compromise or something. So if that's the case, I would bring that out. And how was that, was that an unsuccessful strategy? Was it a distinct strategy they decided to pursue at one phase and then um, uh, because it didn't, wasn't too successful, abandon it? So I think there's something that probably a bit, bit more that the, um, the language of disruption doesn't fully bring out about that phase, which has to do with trying to find ways to accommodate the interests of taxi drivers or taxi companies, even in some cases. I would, I would just ask about that. And have I um, understood that right? 
Um, so I think that's those are the main points I wanted to make. Um, yeah, I said I think perhaps the way to tie in to the um, innovation systems literature might be through the notion of interactive learning and learning a learning process, which um, is part of what also I gather creates and develops le le legitimacy for um, a new innovative platform over time. So that would be um, that would be my main suggestion. And I hadn't thought you know a great deal about it, but that's that was that's what comes to mind. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Ned, Hannah, and John, for make uh, such a wonderful discussion for this paper. You provide a lot of uh, comments that uh, I am uh, positive that Muyang could use in get a better paper from from your observations. Uh, uh, also, I don't know if you have read it yet, but in the chat box uh, there are some questions from Mu Yang. But uh, regrettably, we do not have very much time to read uh, them all and give time to Mu Yang to, res to respond to those comments. So I would like to give you, Mu Yang, uh, just five minutes, no more. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, of course, you do not have to answer all the observations and comments that you receive, because uh, uh, most of them, uh, you just can't use them. Uh, but uh, if you want to make some remarks, some final remarks, you are welcome. And also, I would like to, to stress some aspect uh, specific for this uh, series that uh, are, uh, what are the challenges uh, in your empirical work and uh, regarding to, to, to the collection of the qualitative uh, data and how you accommodate those uh, information in the theoretical framework. And uh, also, what is your advice for, for, for young researchers in Global South uh, to overcome with the problems that you have faced in collecting those data? So um, just five minutes to, to Final remarks uh, for you. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, three professors, for giving give me so many feedback. And for the first, I will uh, further my research on the theory analysis and to my case analysis to match better. And the second uh, is for my case study, the, the tables and to more detail about how I use the interviews or more, uh, give more the readers more uh, details about uh, how I use this data and how I get this data. And the second is the, my uh, um, Professor Jin, that the the con concept about the legitimacy uh, about the action or the products, and this make me to more to think more clearly about what is the legitimacy. Fo focus more on the the concept and uh, also uh, um, make me some uh, insights about the innovation system. And the last one is uh, uh, compare uh, the Uber, make me some sense about the how the difference uh, from DD and Uber uh, let this um, an analysis more um, uh, face the current issues. And for me, the advice for, uh, for uh, for our uh, researches uh, to uh, to communicate more with uh, with teachers and uh, to communicate and to talk with the consumers like uh, even our students um, we we can talk to how uh, you use it and what's your fee what's your feel and to find some different points in the um, theory uh, like the emotional conflict is uh, I found that really true that we if we, at the beginning if we have the uh, emotional conflict we will resist uh, how to use the innovation. And so um, we need to have more interest in our research question. And uh, I thank you for all the three professors and chair uh, to give me time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Muyang. So uh, we are going to go to the next paper now. Uh, so we will keep uh, the schedule 
Uh, right, so Florencia, uh, if you are ready, uh, you can start with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Vero. Vero. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everybody. I think you are uh, saying my presentation. As you know, my name is Florencia Ferentin. I'm from Argentina and I have a presentation based on the, a, a work that has taken like five years of uh, different articles and research projects. And I have to present this in 20 minutes and in English. And this is a challenge itself, but I will, well, I will, I will do my best. And the title of my presentation is From Literature of Innovation System to the Evaluation of uh, Innovation Policy, Challenge, Progress, a Systemic Phenomenon. And the objective of all this research uh, has been based on reflect on the challenge that the complexity of innovation process implies for the design and implementation of evaluation of innovation policy. We have centered of innovation policy in these, uh, in these last years in, uh, in our research. And we, we focus on trying to contribute for an empirical perspective to the theoretical framework that assumes that innovation process is complex and to contribute to the design and implementation of, of innovation policy. Our theoretical framework is based on national system of innovations and the national veteran perspective and from a national innovation system framework, we know that uh, policy is important to foster innovation for, uh, process at the firm level. And why is important to foster innovation process at the firm level? Because uh, when uh, firms innovate, they improve their the economic performance, they are more productive, they uh, develop new products, new processes, they employ more workers. And then if we uh, is, is there, uh, if from with policy, with foster that innovation uh, processes at uh, uh, to several firms, it is supposed that it would trigger better economic performance at the uh, aggregate level as well. And we, we foster innovation policy at firm level, then uh, it will affect um, the aggregate level and economic performance at on the country. And from a national veteran approach, we know that innovation process is complex, it's path dependent, it occurs at the firm level, but the firm is an, in an environment, is in an innovation system, and uh, innovation process depends on the prior capability development of the firm, on the different linkages uh, of the firm with uh, uh, its environment. And we know that firms uh, have an innovative strategy. A part of that innovative strategy is uh, the, the, um, the activity of applying for funding, for public funding. And we also know that firms are different uh, between them. Firms innovate, uh, innovation is a novelty, and firms innovate to be different. That novelty, that innovation is different, and firms innovate uh, to have more rent, and uh, to have a better performance than the other firms, to have new products uh, compared to the other firms. And then we know firms are different and there, are, there is micro heterogeneity. Firms innovate because of that micro heterogeneity, and the innovation process triggers more micro heterogeneity. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I lost my voice for a second. Uh, but um, we also know that, uh, uh, I think this is the most important contribution of the work, policy evaluations and the design of policy do not take into account that micro heterogeneity and don't, do not take into account so much. Sometimes even the studies ignore micro heterogeneity and the systemic nature of the innovation processes. Of the innovation processes. And uh, if innovation is a systemic process, uh, innovation funding is also a systemic process. Uh, and is part of the innovation strategy uh, of the firm. And also, uh, innovation policy is, all, is uh, usually based on policy programs or instruments that are designed from an horizontal perspective, assuming that firms are, um, are um, not uh, heterogeneous, I, I don't remember the word, homogeneous, yes. uh, firms are homogeneous, and uh, they have all the same, they are all. Uh, they have all the same, the same probability to be funded, to be granted. And uh, in practice, uh, innovation policy has not been enough to, uh, 
improves better economic performance and uh, evaluation, uh, evaluations on innovation policy follows linear strategies and they ignore this, this systemic nature of innovation and of uh, policy innovation. In Latin American, in the Latin American countries, innovation uh, evidence showed that innovation policy tends to benefit sector and activities that were already uh, the most dynamic ones. Innovation policy is designed for only a group of firms that are already dynamic because it ignores that firms are different. And then reinforce the, the, the heterogeneity, the, the structural heterogeneity uh, of, the, of these countries. And then it's not enough, it's not strong to trigger process of stru structural change, uh, but even it is strong the, the, the structural heterogeneity of these countries. That's why we need to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to improve the design of policy. And then if innovation, process, innovation is a process and innovation policy is also a process, it has a cycle, it has several steps. First, a firm needs to identify a problem or, or an opportunity before applying for funding. Uh, the firm, once a firm identifies a problem, once the firm identifies an opportunity, the firm designs a project, designs an innovative project to, uh, to address that problem or to uh, take that opportunity. Once the firm designs the project, once the firm uh, decides to, uh, to invest on that project, the firms look for funds, not the instruments uh, that exist, uh, and search for funds, for funds, sorry, and then apply for funding. And uh, once the firm apply is uh, awarded. On this, this part of the innovation uh, of the innovation policy process is not taken account in, in, in studies, in evaluations. Studies are uh, generally centered on the export impact once the firm was awarded. That is because um, uh, uh, challenges that imply the, the databases that I will tell you uh, after. But uh, uh, usually the, the evaluation uh, center on the impact of innovation policy once the firm was awarded. And uh, <clears throat> evidence shows that uh, innovation policy impact on firms' capability, capability development, in, uh, innovative inputs and results, and economic performance. But we don't know so much on the ex ante process. What are the contributions of our research or what uh, we are for, um, which uh, issues we, are we focused? We want to analyze, we were centered on analyzing the entire process of the innovation policy at the firm level. Of course, it has a lot of challenges that I will tell you later at the, the objective of the, the seminar. Um, we have based on our empirical analysis on cross-section surveys on, uh, on firms and panel databases. Uh, we center of the, in the Argentinian case, and the most important uh, in innovative program in Argentina is FONTAR, Argentinian Technological Fund, uh, uh, the main national uh, value, uh, source of public funding uh, for innovation at the firm level. Then we have a cross session databases for all firms uh, in Argentina, and we have the FONTAR databases uh, for firms that applied and were funded uh, by FONTAR. We did several studies. Uh, we have uh, two waves of data databases that can, uh, cannot be merged. We have those, uh, two cross session databases. And this is a CI style survey for all, all Argentinian manufacturing firms. We have the, um, also this uh, limitation we have we, because we all focus on manufacturing firms. And uh, on the first study, we focus on the relationship be between innovation policy, innovation results, results and capabilities at the firm level. In that paper, we the economic strategy was based on a Heckman selection model. Uh, we uh, I, I will not uh, stop on every variable, but we focus on capabilities in innovation results and the role of innovation policy on the development of capabil capabilities of innovation results and. Um, uh, on this uh, and they uh, second two waves of uh, the survey, we have information for, for all firms and between all firms, the ones which applied for FONTAR and were funded, the firm that were funded, the firm that uh, and the firm that were not funded. We have uh, for all uh, firms from Argentina. And then in the second wave on the and they um, 
And they said, we studied the role of perp capability in the benefiting from value for, uh, for innovation. We here, we focus on the allocation process of a uh, FONTA. We also focus on FONTA. Here we uh, development, developed a principal component analysis to focus on different kinds of capabilities, pro, uh, different types of capabilities, productivity capabilities, innovation capabilities, and connectivity capab capabilities. And we wanted to know if capabilities play a role on accessing public funding, if uh, the process of accessing funding depends on pri prior development of capabilities in firms. And after the principal component analysis, we, uh, uh, we studied the order of profit model with the uh, industrial treatment. Uh, the industrial treatment was innovative result. And uh, here we studied the probability of being funding uh, subject to uh, the prior development of capabilities. And the categorical, categorical variable for FONTAR for not knowing, knowing but not having FONTAR and accessed and knowing and accessed FONTAR. Then we have also a panel databases of FONTAR and um, the advantage of the database is that it, this is a panel, but it has only information for firms that apply for FONTAR and firms that were granted. We don't know about that firm that did not apply for FONTAR or, the, or do, that firm that do not know about FONTAR. And here we also center on the allocation process and, and expo dynamic uh, impact. We also, that has also that is, uh, to the extent that FONTAR database is a panel um, from 20 or 6 um, until now, we can uh, study also the dynamic impact of innovation, of innovation policy, because to the extent that this is a, a, this is a dynamic process, the, the impact may, may be dynamic. Uh, we, in, we have uh, the several article, articles based on these FONTAR databases. databases. We have mostly ran the, uh, random dy uh, effect dynamic um, Provide model for uh, panel databases. Uh, we control uh, microterogeneity by means of the inclusion of unobserved defects using the solutions proposed by Mandelak, Chamberlain, and Woodbridge. Um, they are solutions, they are not enough to control microterogeneity, and I will uh, 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 talk about this later. I'm looking at, uh, at the clock. And we have also run random effect model because we generally have a, a binary variables from access to FONTAR or did not access to FONTAR. Uh, and we have um, also um, addressed microterogeneity by studying uh, microterogeneity in this group of funded firms by studying firms that were granted only once and firms that were granted more than once. Recurrent firms are. Um, 50% of the firms uh, funded, 15, 60% uh, of the firms funded by FONTAR. We also study with a uh, panel databases dynamic impact, and we made a set of binary variables that are equal to one to, um, on this year of uh, program support to attempt for the dynamic impact. And we uh, focus on firms' capabilities, innovation, investment, and productivity to see capabilities, um, input, and um, economic performance uh, in terms of productivity. Well, we use um, several control variables, uh, the, the traditional and the commercial ones, size of the firms, expenditure of uh, innovation activities, exporting, exporting conditions, et cetera. And um, the results are very interesting uh, and um, uh, we found that <clears throat> the allocation process is an important stage of innovation policy. Allocation process is important, and if we only focus on the impact of innovation policy we, without studying the example process, we only see one part of the picture. Uh, firms' productivity, uh, I'm sorry, reflect productivity, innovation and connectivity capabilities impact on the probability of knowing about and accessing to innovation fund. Firms need to have accumulate a, a minimum level of capabilities to access to public funding. <clears throat> and formulation, is, uh, we have also the formulation skills. Firms need to know to complete a formulation to apply for funding. And this impacts the probabilities, uh, this possibly impact the probabilities of accessing funding. Uh, and innovation capabilities impact the probabilities or being uh, granted more than once. Capabilities are important to accessing funds. 
firms are different, and that firm that which ha that have not accumulated an enough level of capabilities are not able to apply for funding and to be granted. Uh, this is not a, a problem per se, but the problem is there are a, a, a very big group of firms that are not access to fund and then they do not innovate. And then uh, innovation policy, which is designed to, um, to um, generate a structural change is not enough and even um, increasing the, the bad heterogeneity in, in a country like Argentina. And uh, regarding the impact, um, uh, innovation policy, in fact, different over time. First, in the short term, in, 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 the, in the capabilities of the firms, in the medium term, in innovation invest, investment, and in the long term, in economic, uh, pro, uh, in economic performance, in productivity. <clears throat> What, are, what has been the challenge? I have four minutes, I think I am okay. The challenge that we had on this analysis uh, and the, the challenge that I have for my uh, PhD thesis, I mean, my PhD research, and that's why I'm really happy being here to, to hear your comments. Uh, as I say, Fontar databases only contain information and friends that apply for funds. And this is a problem related to the design of policy, right? Because if we design policy from a linear perspective, uh, from uh, uh, assuming that firms, firms are homogeneous. That affects the uh, databases that result from uh, the implementation of that policy. Then uh, databases implies difficult to study a policy from a systemic and a complex view and to analyze micro heterogeneity. Uh, and they has more information that uh, from our database that is the panel, but it's CI is, is database and um, it's a cross section. It has all the problems, that, that all the difficulties that cross section implies. And empirical models, including our empirical models, are still based on linear assumption. I, uh, in my ma master, um, in my master dissertation, dissertation, I want to study micro heterogeneity and. Uh, how microterogeneity uh, affect the process of, of allocation of, of Fontar, and, and, and I can't solve that. I, I am thinking about cluster analysis, but I, I, I still think that, I'm, that it's not enough to, to completely agree with, uh, with theory. And then we, if we have a still a empirical model based on linear assumption, we cannot uh, ask systemic research questions. We have no empirical, uh, tools to, uh, um, to address a systemic research question or, ma or make uh, systemic evaluations. Well, I told uh, uh, a little about the next step. Uh, I think new theoretical and empirical students are needed to enhance our knowledge on systemic process of innovation policy. We have to understand that innovation policy is systemic, it's a complex process, it's part of the innovation strategy of the firm. Uh, I, I think that we have to um, to combine qualitative analysis with quantitative analysis, uh, in particular because of the limitations of uh, uh, databases. And uh, well, the, uh, innovation is a systemic process. It's very important to study the allocation process to, um, to make that innovation policy uh, can, uh, to, to make more firms to access to innovation policy. And uh, uh, to understand uh, the impact of in innovation policy of firms, because if firms, uh, some characteristics of the firm make them more likely to access to funds, these characteristics of the firms may, um, may make uh, the, the, innovation the innovation instrument impact different. The impact may be different in different firms because firms are different. Uh, and we uh, need empirical analysis based on nonlinear strategies uh, to better address this complex process of systemic um, of innovation and um, innovation at the firm level. Thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you very much, Florencia, for sticking on time. Also, and uh, now we are we are going to to the to the to the discussion. Uh, we we will start with uh, Michael uh, uh, Awolye. I don't know how you 
pronounced your last name. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, so, Mike, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, once again, uh, please remind the, 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 the goals of these seminars in your comments. That, that would be very nice. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry, uh, be... Uh, take care of the time so we can uh, have some time for, for discussion after your comments. All right, thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, that was a very good paper. Uh, you have done so well with that, your presentation. You have um, attempted to work on, from literature on innovation systems to the evaluation of innovation policy challenges to address uh, systemic phenomena. And um, one of the major issues that provoke the thought, according to what you have presented, has to do with um, that there is neither the design nor the policy evaluation have addressed the issue of microheterogeneity. And then one other thing to say is that, um, that they have not also adequately addressed the systemic nature of innovation process. At the same time, that innovation process have not been fully analyzed and recognized as a systemic process. And that is why you are, think you are having a rethink for developing countries like Argentina, especially the manufacturing company, to see what how best you can position the way to go so as to be for them to be able to innovate and to bring the expected structural change that is expected in developing countries. Um, uh, one of the things you said in your paper is that there is an old consensus that the in literature about NIH that sustains the need for public policy to foster innovation process at farm level. Um, and that um, some of these has not really, in the context of developing countries, worked for uh, developing countries. But then I can say categorically here, we all have evidence all around that uh, this has apparently, NIH has actually worked for the developed countries, emerging economies, and um, for even countries in Africa, so to, to a great extent. Even though we believe that in developing countries like Africa, like uh, Argentina and all of that, have not really come to the expect the structural change expected in those countries are not yet there. But then I agree with you that there's also a need for us since NI has been existing for about 30 years. And then we have been, you know, conducting a number of researches, both qualitative and quantitative, but yet it seems as if developing countries are not yet there. They have, it's like they have not really started. Um, so I quite agree with you that there's a need for everything. So um now, uh, it's not going to say, to say that um, innovation policy impacts France performance uh, and then innovative um, economic performance as well. And that's why it is necessary for firms to innovate. It is necessary for firms to innovate. But because of the heterogeneity among firms, um, firm A has some capabilities which would definitely be different from firm B and so on and so forth and firm C and things like that. Now, I quite agree with you because we mentioned the issue of absorptive capacity. There's a need for them to have um, absorptive capacity to be able to see, even if they want to imitate technologies, even if they want to absorb technologies, do they have uh, the local capacity to be able to do this? And which has to do with the educational background of some of their, of their um, staff. It has to do with the scientific background of the, possibly the operation manager for in productive uh, production environment and a number of that. I quite like um, the way you have um, used two sets of data. You have used two sets of data for 2000 and between, uh, I'm talking about the selection of your data set for this analysis. Uh, you have used um, other set data for Argentina, man from, for Argentina manufacturing companies or firms for two sets between 2010 and 2012. And then you have done the same for 2014 and 2016. So, but then, uh, you, and then this questionnaire actually, this data set actually have uh, leverage on size type survey, which is quite interesting, which is the OECD standard for innovation survey. And then even the three years interval between them is quite impressive. But then my challenge is there is, a, there is one year gap in between those years that you have uh, used. Uh, that is 2013 is missing. So I don't know if, if that is fine, since the two uh, data sets are independent of the other. So there's a need for you 
to ensure that there's no bias between the two data sets. So there's a need for you to do that. So uh, now, now that we have seen, or we have not really established because we have not completed this research, that um, hen and hairs have not actually worked for the developing countries. And I think for me, Rajesh is here to bear me witness that uh, India have after, apparently leveraged on through their innovation. And that has worked for them to a great extent. Tata is an example of um, you know, company that have leveraged on Fuga innovation that can assist them to, to, to work for, from the bottom of the pyramid to take them to where they need to get, at least to provide, even still maintaining some of the qualities that is expected from their products and services, but then using the available uh, financial resources to achieve that. So I think that the need also for developing countries like Argentina to begin to think Fuga innovation and um, to assist them to, to leapfrog. So, and uh, let me quickly go mention, give one or two comments here regarding, um, uh, yes, you have in, in your data set, I, I, sorry, in your analysis, I noticed you have done a number of uh, quantitative analysis, which is quite impressive. But I noticed you have used qualified employment as dependent variable. And I was wondering um, the, the relevance of qualified employment and how do you how do you how do you um, how do you get how do you which policy did you use to get qualified employment and do you think among the existing uh, innovation measures that we have in, in literature do you think a good number of innovation measures that are that are available in literature? You should have used one of them. For example, now measures of innovation performance to be uh, done using variables, whether they have innovated or not, whether those firms have innovated or not, um, which could be a binary uh, you know, um, variable, and then which will still be in line with the COVID, um analysis you have conducted in this work. So um, I'm quite not clear about how you have used the qualified employment. You, can, you could also use attempt to, you can also check the attempts to innovate whether they have innovated or not. And then even though they may not have completed the innovation, that's fine. That's also part of the standard of OECD, uh, which is funding CRS, which is as provided. Then you can also use financial measures. Since you are bothered about whether they were able to assess uh, grants or funding from government, you can also use financial measures, such as um, maybe profitability, emanating from the innovation activities they have carried out within their funds. You need to know whether they have carried out innovations and then how, how much of that has translated to profit for the organization. Then also say turnover is another thing, how much the innovation they have, um, they, have, um, they, have, they have done or they have been involved in has assisted them to have more turnover or to even have uh, you know, a larger market share from the, from the firm. Then, um, also expect you that um, the, the uh, quantitative analysis of this quantum should attract precautionary analysis, you know, not just an analyzing, go straight away to analysis without being, uh, carrying out normality tests, without carrying out um, whether there is a culinarity within your variables, because I did not see you mention any of these, and then whether there is the equal variance as well, which is almost, almost pedastic, which is expected you know, before you subject your data set to analysis. I do not see any of this, and I think it's very important because these are some of the things that would um, um, tell us how, how reliable your measures are. And then also try to do what we rely, uh, call, um, what we refer to as rel um, reliability analysis as well. You can use Combat Alpha or some other, or other, other ones like that related to measure the, the reliability of your, of your variables. So, uh, then I have not really seen in your presentation, I'll do a very fascinating presentation. I personally have not seen the connection between the NIS, or maybe I was expecting to see the framework, the existing uh, NIS framework for Argentina, you know, for Argentina rather. Uh, you have not presented that to us because you know, for me, all I know about NIS is, oh, you want to see the interaction between the academia you want to see the interaction, you want to see the role of government in academia, the role of government, and then you want to see the financial institution, the role that they play, as well as the private firms. You know, look, talking about the linkages that government is using policy instruments 
to control them, how the academia is uh, relating with the farms and things like that. At the same time, how the farms at the same time are uh, possibly taking input from the academia to, to translate it into innovation process and then take the product to the market. So we have not, have not seen in this presentation the, the, the what is in existence in the, the framework that you are using in Argentina. So but, but, but all the same, I think this is a very good presentation, but then like I've said, try to, try to include a few things that I've mentioned to, in order to improve um, your presentation, sorry, to improve the, the, the quality of your paper. So let me quickly drop it here and then I'll come back again later to say one or two things. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, very much. Uh, we are going uh, to John, John's comments now. Uh, shall Florence, please take note of everything. You have uh, very nice uh, comments here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, it's uh, for me. It's uh, it's a uh, very interesting, and I know that's more about Argentina, and uh, as well as the innovation system in the Argentina, and uh, so I have some of the. From that the presentation and the abstract, I think this is like the more like the proposal of the dissertation. I'm not sure. For me, I would think it's more like the dissertation, the proposal of the dissertation. So include several several paper or several chapters of the dissertation. For example, is the literature review. Uh, so that is like the literature review or the system, systematic uh, uh, literature review of the innovation policies, uh, innovation system. And the second is about how to evaluation of the innovation policies, especially like the role of the IP in the innovation policies. And the third is, is like the empirical research this is about the impact of the innovations, innovation policies on the capability and the performance of the companies. So this is what I think. This is more like the three chapters of one dissertation. Um, and for this the design of this the research, um, I, I have uh, the other the comments and uh, some of the comments and for the improvements. The first one, and for your research, it's especially like for your empirical research. So please that, uh, think about the policy or the innovation policy. Is the national level or the sector level? Because you have talking about the um, the policy, the impact of the policy on the firm capabilities, innovation capabilities, and performance. So. Uh, I believe they also have the policy from the from the national and as well as the sector innovation system. So you must make it very clear which the perspective you look at. And the other is like the um, so is uh, I I agree that the, some of the comments and from the Alu. Uh, a low season and on the variables and the empirical analysis. And so you must pay attention about the, the data, data setting, as well as like uh, uh, how to, the measurement of the variables. And this is for the research methodologies as also is, is IP efficiency, efficient in the research. You, focus on the IP. So, but uh, is it uh, most important in the innovation system, especially like now we talk up a lot, talk, talk about the digital technology and impact of the digital technology on the innovation system. So they will be have some of the change. Maybe there is not many the patents, but they still have a lot of the innovation. So that is you have to think about for this one. And the other is like, uh, mm, the other comments is, oh, what you want. Um, I suggest you, um, you give a research framework 
you should have that more clear the research framework. Otherwise, it's not so easy for all of uh, for me and to understand the broad the picture of your research. And this is uh, one of the comments on this one. And uh, let me see the article. Ah, yeah. Um, the other I have that's the comments and for the innovation um, system. Um, perhaps it's not for this paper. And uh, when I look at this one, I will think is maybe we have to think about how to design uh, innovation system. It's from the bottom up or from the up down. And that is also, we have to think when you talk about the policy allocation, is this right? I'm not sure if it's correct. Allocation, is this that is uh, we can use the theories and from the strategy management is, uh, for example, the resource de redeployment resource redeployment. So that means it's we only have one part, one resource. When we change our the policy, we have to relocate our the resources. So that is, this is one. And also is, I, I agree that the, um, the, author, the presenter is about the systematic uh, you now that's uh, from all that your presentation you have a uh, weakness about the systematic process um, from your data I don't think it's easy for you to measure about the systematic process of the innovation policy and uh, the other is um, the last uh, comment is uh, like uh, innovation policy the process of innovation or the innovation process Sometimes I I confuse and for this uh, definition, you use the innovation pro process of innovation policy. And you also have the innovation process. So for me, I would think that is a different. So that is all my comments and thank you. Thank you, Jun. So uh, now the floor is here for your comments, please. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I enjoyed this paper. It makes a uh, creative use of um, different data sets and different methods to tackle, obviously, some very complex problems. Um, unless I didn't receive a full text, of course, we have just the summary. So um, it just hints at the results, and we don't have any tables of regression, so you can't really look at the details yet. Um, so I thought I would, um, at least in part, Say what I think you might want to do in order to, you know, move towards a publication. Um, first, you do go over, you know, relevant literature, and you refer to the work of people like Edquist, um, uh, Chaminade, uh, Boras, and so on. Um, I think it would be still useful to give um, a more general discussion of what are the main types of innovation policies, and then to situate and to emphasize the ones that you're um, focusing on. For example, Edquist and Boris um, refer to policies uh, that ca categorize regulatory instruments, economic and financial instruments, and soft instruments, what they say are often referred to as the sticks, carrots, and sermons. And I see that you are focusing on the second category. Um, so you, that's narrowing down what you're looking at. It's looking at the economic and financial instruments. And even there, there are some differences that might be useful to bring out, like um, there can be policies which um, aren't specific to the firm that just any any firm will get R&D subsidies as a matter of course if they spend versus um, competitive research funding based um, policies that target specific firms. I, I understand that's what you're focusing on in this um, in the discussion of Fong Fong. Fontar, they they apply and they're granted or not, but maybe I didn't fully understand. So in that respect, I would say um, it would be useful to go into some detail about how um, Fontar works and really lay it out, spell it out. What are the um, what is the mechanisms? What is the what are the tools? And um, and then illustrate also that this why you don't think this is a systemic policy and make that you know uh, that the, make that part of your 
an introduction and introductory discussion. And um, and then the um, go into some of the evaluation literature more explicitly to show that it doesn't actually take into account firm level heterogeneity, which is one of your main points, and that that has to be taken into account to have adequate policies. Um, okay. Um, I think I would like an introductory section which summarizes the three econometric exercises and explains clearly in general as a kind of introduction, what are they designed to do? How does each one relate to the other? And what are the, um, you know, the objectives of, of each of them? So that the reader can sort of clearly see you know why these why they're presented as in the order they are and how they relate to each other um that would be something that i think um would be useful when you develop this um if i understand the first set of regressions that you're running they're asking does being innovative and having access to support have an impact on the firm's capabilities, which you measure, measure through the um, share of highly qualified, qualified employees as a measure of the um, capabilities of the firm. So in this case, treatment is, um, I understand, is being innovative. And um, I suppose that might seem, I think people come into these kinds of discussions and they expect you're gonna be trying to figure out, they're gonna, you know, the treatment is gonna be policy. And what is it, the impact, which we're explaining is innovativeness. But here we have um, treatment being um, innovative and the dependent variable is um, having highly qualified employees. So you use a selection uh, mechanism, which seems appropriate, but keep in mind the Heckman selection, while it deal with selection bias, it won't deal with endogeneity bias for the reasons like simultaneity. So that, that mechanism of just having Heckman doesn't deal with a possible um, endogeneity due to simultaneity, simultaneity between the dependent and dependent variables. And I would think this would be a case in point where you would likely have it. Now the second one goes, I think it's sort of things like really into the core objectives of the paper, it's analyzing the exampi allocation process. And that's sort of maybe the originality is you're focusing on that more than just what is the impact of treatment policy on innovation? Um, so dependent variable here is having access to support and treatment is being innovative. Um, and you have endogenous treatment model with different capabilities or the excluded instruments so they're serving as the exclusion predictions. And then the third act, third we go into a dynamic um, exercise, which sounds, it uses this data set, which sounds extremely interesting. And it would be, you'll have to, of course, when you do a paper, present it in more detail and have the descriptives and show exactly what, what, what's in that data set. Um, so you're extending to dynamic aspects using a random effects model. And um, I know you state, Fontrar impacts firms capabilities in the short term, innovative investments in the medium term, productivity in the long term. So we're still not looking at the impact on innovation. If I'm right, we're looking at other kinds of impacts of, of um, policy. And you control this, you say use a way of controlling for unobserved homogeneity. And that's one of the things you're interested in, I gather. But of course, controlling for bias doesn't mean that we begin, we have much insight into the sources of heterogeneity. And I would assume that for a policy to be effective, we need to identify what are the sources of heterogeneity that are important. So I don't know whether you get, get a handle on that in your, in your, in your empirical work, but it's a question. Finally, um, the race limitations and about the linear factors of looking at things linearly and we're looking at correlations. So my question would be, um, would you agree that complementary way that would be useful to advance on the nonlinear systemic way would be to be doing more qualitative and case study work as well, complementary to a multi-methods approach to the econometrics, which as you say, they see things necessarily as a linear process. So that would be my comments and my questions. 
Thank you, Ned. Um, uh, Florencia, do you want to, to answer some of the comments brought by the discussant? Uh, or, or, again, you don't know, you, you don't have to, to answer each point of them. I think uh, you will be uh, take uh, advantage of, of all of them in your next version of your paper. But if you want to make some uh, some final remarks, uh, the floor is for you. Yeah, thank you, Vera. I, I want to, to say thank you to everyone uh, for their comments. I, and I don't know how many I have work, uh, I have written a lot. Uh, I, um, it's very important for me. Uh, um, uh, these comments, I, I, there are, they are a lot. I have not uh, more time. I have not answer for all your question. That, that's also the true. And uh, I just want to, to say that, uh, yes, this presentation is the result of several papers and is also um, the base for my master dissertation. That's why you can identify like several ch uh, chapters of uh, thesis that is not, uh, uh, that is not a uh, fine uh, thesis. I have not finished uh, it uh, yet. And yes, we have different databases. We have different uh, empirical strategies. Uh, in general, uh, the, variable, uh, the variables for qualify, qualify employment is, and they are particular questions, is um, employment with a tertiary or university degree over all employment in uh, invest on innovation is uh, uh, invest of innovation over sales. And innovations is in R and D, mach machinery and equipment, and consumery, and so on of that. Uh, I I take your comments. I, I I don't want to to lose the part of the the own discussion. And yes, I I take all your comments. Thank you very much, and I hope you can read uh, something written by me later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Florencia. Uh, we have some time for uh, open debate. Um, I think that both presentations bring very interesting topics about how to to, to shed light on the use of uh, qualitative and quantitative data in the theory, and also they show uh, the, the the difficulties, the obstacles of applying and searching and. Uh, and, and, and collecting those data. Uh, so uh, if you are agree, I will uh, ask to the to the audience to bring their questions. Uh, I will I would like to start with uh, Xing Wei, that uh, posted uh, uh, several interesting remarks in the in the question box. So Xing Wei, would would you like to open your mic and uh, bring some of your comments here? Okay, thank you uh, for the chance. Um, um, Florcia, and uh, for your um, presentation, I think it's very uh, interesting. For me, I think the uh, best question is, um, what is the uh, capability of the, uh, for the uh, firms? Because in my opinion, I think uh, um, you mentioned a lot, uh, times about the capability of the firms in terms of the uh, innovative uh, policy. But uh, I think it, it, there must be some uh, difference between the uh, uh, um, uh, 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 firm's capability and the firm's uh, uh, competitiveness. But I think you must uh, have a very clear definition about uh, the uh, key item, I mean, the uh, 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 firm's capability uh, because once you have the clear definition on this key item, I think you can have a clear uh, um, um, uh, map in your research framework. Another question uh, is about uh, you know uh, the policy. Uh, maybe I, in, in, from my understand, I think uh, it's uh, the main key. Pro uh, a key uh, player is the uh, government agency, but you mentioned about, about many times for the uh, uh, firms. So what is the key 
role uh, uh, role player in the uh, policy making process. I think uh, this one you also need to uh, consider very well. Uh, another uh, very key uh, issue is, is that the um, for a new policy or a, uh, innovative policy, uh, different sectors they need to uh, a lot of time to uh, you know digest uh, to um, integrate into their own system. So you need to consider the uh, innovative uh, policy in different sectors, how to they uh, you know, uh, grow into their own system and how they can you know, bring different uh, sectors in the form of uh, integrative uh, capability for your uh, research party. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to bring some of the questions for the other uh, for for Mu Yang that you already posted in the in the book? Or could you like to? Uh, for her uh, research, I think uh, um, uh, my question I really want to ask is uh, uh, you know from the social network perspective. How the uh, um, gender uh, digital uh, platform, I mean the DD, can you know get uh, opt the uh, uh, the the how to say the control power in the social networks because the control power can you know uh, uh, um, help DD you know uh, obtain the the how to say uh, the uh, key uh, driving uh, force to uh, you know, grow its uh, um, uh, legacy in all the stakeholders. I think that is a very uh, key uh, concern in his uh, uh, in her research questions. Thank you. Thank you. Also in the um, also in the in the in the. Uh, Question box. There are uh, other remarks. Uh, Shosain uh, shared a paper uh, on policy on how policy making pros, uh, how make how, how policy shape uh, technological progress in Latin America. And that I think I think is very important. And also there are several ask for your presentations uh, that you made today. The PPTs. Uh, so if you could like to share them. Uh, I think Rajesh would could uh, post it in the in the website or something like that. I think it would be nice for the people that are attending right now. Uh, are there other people that would like to uh, bring some questions? Uh, please open your mic and uh... okay, I, I I can see now Martin Mbasha that also has posted some posted some uh, observation in the chat box. Please, Martin. I shall greetings. Uh, my name is Martin from Nairobi, Kenya, studying at University of Victoria, PhD candidate. Mine is just an observation or comment. Uh, on April 7th, 2021, during the Freeman series, there was a whole debate on the issue of causality. When you think of policy, innovation policy, and innovation systems. And uh, Boras presented a book, uh, Ed Kiss presented a book he's been working, he's recently released with uh, Boras, um, uh, Holistic Innovation Systems. I've included it in the chat. Um, it may be worth a look for the second presenter. Uh, I noted the presentation was mostly quantitative. Uh, there's a whole set of interesting debates in there. I think Lawrence took part in that uh, particular exchange. So there may be some interesting thoughts there, just a contribution. I've included the exact moment where Ed Kist speaks. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for the recommendation. I also think that the uh, books, uh, Ed Quist books, uh, would help her a lot. Uh, also is uh, raising the hand, Elias. So Elias, please, uh, you can talk now. Hi, good morning or good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to participate in this session. I only want to recommend to Florencia Fiorentin 
that she checks the notion of sectoral innovation systems from Franco Molerba. I think that this notion is very, will be very useful for your doctoral research only, especially for the importance to the base of knowledge for analyze the relationships between organizations and institutions under innovation system approach. Thank you very much. Veronica, you are, you are mute. Please unmute, Vero. Thank you, thank you for noting that. I, I, I said that I don't see uh, any other uh, raising hand right now. So um, if there is not, I would give uh, the floor to, to Muyan and Florencia for final, final remarks, just two more minutes for, for each of them. Uh, starting with Muyan, if, if you agree Muyan, you can uh, open your mic and say some final remarks. Uh, you are uh, you are mute. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, it is my honor to be here to share my research uh, and uh, to uh, gain so many feedback about my research question. And um, and and thank you for all the professors and. Uh, um the uh, our uh, students to to share your research and i will further my study and to maybe connect the professors to uh, further my research and thank you thank you all Valencia, do you want to say some final remarks, some final words? Uh, yes, thank you very, thank you very much. I, I was reading the, the comments on the on the chat. I, I cannot hear on the or your question, but I, I let you my email. Then please to I'm pleased to to keep discussing and talking, of course. And uh, I took the, the advice about sectoral uh, innovation system. I had just read the message and copy and paste that and. You just talked and and say that I I, I also um, have the link of you too about the Lamb, uh, Lumba Lumbalanet Kit discussion and I I have time uh, for mail I, I think it's not necessary to to answer all this question because we we will never end this uh, the reunion but thank you thank you very much I'm really happy of finding here okay so. Final thank you for myself. Uh, thank you very much for Mayun and Florencia for bringing your papers here. It's very interesting for us to listen to you. It's very uh, inspiring to see su such good and quality research made by very young researchers. I, I have to say that I, I, I was uh, a teacher of Florencia when she did uh, he, her uh, degree in economics, so it's, it's a very uh, moving to me here, uh, see her uh, presenting this paper, uh, preparing his PhD dissertation. So uh, I also, I would like to thank very, very much for the discussions, for, for the discussion that uh, bring a lot of very interesting points that uh, could uh, enhance the research of uh, these young scholars. And uh, if you agree, Rajesh, do you want to say final words and invite the people for the next activity? No, nothing, Jana, you can close it. And before closing, let us all say bye-bye and- uh, Yeah, and, open uh, your mics and say goodbye. <laughs> and even, and, 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 and be-, be And please be, be very- uh, be, be aware of, of the next activities that we will be announced soon uh, during uh, January. I think this is the last activity before holidays, so 
also I I would say happy holidays to Christmas holidays to all of them, to, lo, to all of you. You're right. Thank you. Yeah. Our next bye. program is seventh January. Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye. 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 Merry Christmas. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Goodbye from Mexico. Bye. Thank, thank you, Rakesh, Goodbye. for everything. Goodbye from Ethiopia. Thank you, Rakesh. Bye bye. Bye bye from you. Nigeria. Nice seeing you here. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, very Daniel. Much. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Hi. Thank you very much you. for the, those great comments. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Bye. Rajesh. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. I guess. Thank you. We'll see you. Great, Mike. Yeah, bye. <laughs> Great comments. Thanks very much. All right. Bye -bye. And Justina, you are you are going to be you are presenting on twenty first, right? Come again. Justina is presenting on twenty first. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's the last last episode. Yeah. All right. Okay. Then thank you very much. Bye.